Hey there. Hey there. Uh, hello there. So welcome audience. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the 13th edition of IGDC. This year we have had 120 plus eminent speakers sharing their invaluable experiences, insights, trends and professional as well as personal journeys over the last few days. Today in this session, I am thrilled to have Alan Wolfie with us and talk about Wallet Physics, a simple but effective method for physics simulation in games. Before we jump into the session, I would like to introduce Adam. Alan is a self-taught hobbyist game programmer. He has over 20 years of game development experience. The chip titles including StarCraft 2, Heroes of the Storm, Gotham City Imposters, Line Rider, and Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet. Ellen keeps a technical blog with over 200 articles at blog.demofox.org on topics ranging from skeletal animation programming to audio synthesis to quantum programming. He also has an unhealthy level of fascination with glue noise and other stochastic rendering methods. As a session format goes, we have 30 minutes for presentation plus 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. The audiences can type their questions into Q&A tab. Only question asked in the Q&A tab would be taken up with the speaker. The feedback form for the link will be shared in handout tab. Please take a minute to fill this very important survey, which helps us improve this session even more. With this intro, I would like to hand it over to Alan. Alan, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Rupesh. Hello, everyone. Um, it's it's a real honor to be here, and uh, I wanted to thank you for your interest in in uh, my presentation. Uh, let me share the uh, my screen real quick. There we go. Uh, my, my camera broke at the last minute, um, but that's okay because here's the presentation. That's uh, the thing that really matters. So, so let's get started. Um, yeah, so as, as Rupesh said, um, I am a... Uh, um, I'm a self-taught game programmer that went professional, and uh, to, to talk... Uh, quick a bit about uh, my path. Um, I started working retail while self-teaching, like during high school and just after, and uh, did that for a few years while going home and trying to read books and practice. Uh, and after that, I had a couple years of business programming before a, a game studio would give me a chance. Uh, but it worked out in the end. Um, since then, I worked at small companies and large companies both, and I did gameplay uh, generalist programming, engine generalist programming. And then I also did uh, specialist programming in a number of roles, like Rupesh said, uh, audio programming, skeletal animation, online engineering, rendering. More recently, I worked on Diablo 4 doing graphics for a while, and that game is going to be amazing. Uh, I haven't seen it for a couple of, uh, probably about two years now, but when I left, it was looking great and on a great trajectory. So uh, that thing is going to be awesome. <clears throat> So today's topic is on Verlay physics, and where I first encountered them was in LineRider uh, when working on LineRider 2. If anyone knows what LineRider is, uh, it, it, it was originally a Flash game, and you can periodically see new incarnations of it coming out, uh, and that game uses Verlay physics. So uh, this presentation, it's going to show uh, a very easy to implement but effective method of doing, um, for doing game physics. And these are going to be useful for uh, ropes, solid objects, chains, cloth, hair, even uh, character controllers. You can make uh, slime monsters that when you hit, they jiggle, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, we'll be working in 2D, but these methods work just as well in 3D for the most part. The only kind of complications are like, uh, uh, there's a few things that get more complicated when you go up a dimension, like calculating normals and things. But for the most part, uh, it just works. More formally, this is going to be called a positional overlay integration. Uh, there's other types of, of uh, overlay, but why we're using this one is because you get a lot of emergent behavior for free, which you guys will see. Something important to note is that this is not for physically accurate simulations. This is just for plausible physics for games. And I wanted to note uh, that this is... Uh, um, some of the methods, uh, there are more complicated and better results methods to what we're doing. But this is uh, the results you're going to get from the things we talk about today are, by and large, very good. 
um, and they're a great starting point to to use in your own games until until you outgrow them. And then from there, uh, you can look for alternatives. And I have a couple links to uh, uh, kind of like the next steps at the end of this talk. So first up, uh, let's derive the Verlet update equation, which it sounds pretty mathy, but it's it's going to be pretty easy. So stay with me. So if if you just think about physics and you want to program some physics, if you have an object, really what you want to know is how do you move an object uh, from where it was last frame to be where it should be this frame, and that's that's what the our physics update equation is going to do for us. So uh, the we have something called the semi-implicit Euler method, where uh, you calculate a new velocity based on uh, the the current velocity and acceleration and how long uh, the frame took to render. After you calculate a new velocity for this frame, then you can update the position by using that velocity times the time step and adding that to the position. Uh, this this totally works. Like it's it's physically accurate, mathematically accurate. But when you actually try to program it, you kind of hit some problems. So we're going to take a non-obvious step right now, and we're going to plug the velocity formula into the position formula to make a single formula. And so when we do that, we get this one formula where we um, update the position in one step with the, the velocity in there. Uh, we're no longer updating the velocity, but you can, uh, you can notice that the velocity that an object is moving can be seen as how far it moved uh, the last uh, two updates. So basically, um, the last frame, how far did it move? That can give you a velocity, and it's like an implicit velocity. And so if we update the equation, we can actually put that in. So here, uh, we have this implicit velocity equation, where in the green, we don't actually have a real velocity. We just take the last two positions, divide them, or subtract them and divide by the old time step, and that gives us the velocity without us actually having to track it. Uh, and then from there, we can just straight up update the position um, by only needing to know the last two positions of the particle. And so this is the, the Verlet update equation. And we can take that to code pretty easily. So here's, here's the function for it at the top. It's only four lines of code. Uh, put in some comments to make it more readable. But yeah, uh, line four, we calculate the velocity based on the last two positions. Line seven, we update uh, the position from the current position to the new position using that velocity. And we use the acceleration. Um, and then we just update last position and current position so that the next time we do an update, it'll work. Um, one thing to note is that you may be wondering, like, hey, where do I put in player input or uh, gravity, things like that. Basically, you take all those things as forces and you, you put them in as uh, the acceleration. Um, oh, yeah, and hi, uh, Kenan's asking on, on the chat, can we get this demo project? Um, right now, the code is not available. I'll work on making it uh, consumable for you guys, so... Yeah, uh, actually, at the end, there's there's a a playable shader, uh, shader toy game too that I linked to that you can look at. But yeah, I'll work on getting uh, the demo to you guys. So yeah, uh, once again, if you have uh, player input or AI input, uh, gravity things like that, you just sum them all together and put them into acceleration. So hopefully, this video comes through. I was doing a presentation at Nvidia internally of this to like do some practice a couple days ago. And the video was pretty choppy. Uh, it looks like it's working a little bit better. But for those of you, in case it isn't, uh, what's going on here is particles are spawning in the middle of the screen. And they're coming upwards with a, a random velocity. And gravity's pulling them back down. Uh, so this is what we have right now for our, our physics simulation. Uh, as I was saying, we only store the last two positions of a particle. And there's no velocity. So how we do the random velocity is that we initialize uh, the current position to be where the, where the particle should spawn, and we initialize the previous position to being the starting position minus the velocity. And so that's how we, we spawn a particle with, with some velocity in it. Uh, but the, these physics are pretty boring. So here we can add a ground plane. And all we do for this, uh, for this simulation is we say, if the y position of a ball is ever less than 0, then just set it to 0. And that's all that it takes to make a ground plane. 
And so the balls, they land on the ground, and they actually roll. And we didn't actually have to program the rolling. It just comes out as an emergent behavior. And the reason for that is because uh, we're only touching uh, the Y component of the position, and so the Y position of the velocity. So that part is getting zeroed out, but the X component is still there, and so that's what allows it to roll. We are also adding some friction into this demo, and how we do that is uh, when a ball has had to be pushed back up to y equals zero, we, we set a bool that the ball is touching the ground. And when that bool is true, uh, we add um, a vector to the acceleration that's in the opposite direction of velocity, but we multiply it by a small constant. And so what that is is it just pushes back against the velocity a little bit. So uh, in the last demo we showed we could make more interesting physics by making the constraint that, um, that the particles had to be above the ground. But this isn't the only type of constraint we can add. Um, oh, another question from the chat. Uh, so the question is, do, all, do engines have all these functionalities pre-programmed or do we have to write it from scratch? So uh, as I'll show, I have a slide at the, the end where uh, well, it basically says uh, the PhysX library from NVIDIA has a, a particle-based physics simulation. And you can grab that if you just want a physics simulation and use it. Other, uh, other engines like Unreal and Unity, they have physics built in, and you can just grab these and use them. Uh, but the talk today I wanted to give was on how you can actually write them yourself. And it's really not all that much work and all, not all that much math, and you get a pretty good result. So yeah, if, if you just want to use something canned, they are definitely out there. So yeah, uh, besides adding constraints with the ground, you can make particles can be constrained against each other. And one way you can do that is you can say that two particles must be a certain distance apart. And so when you have that, uh, you can basically make a stick. And so like no matter which way two particles are oriented, there will always be a line between them of a certain distance. You can also make an angle constraint where uh, the angle between three points A, B, and C must be some number of degrees, like you, you can make them a right angle. Uh, you can also say that the distance or angle has to be limited between two values, or you might say there's only a minimum or only a maximum. Uh, another thing you can do is you can say if a constraint is ever violated too strongly, that you disable it. And so in that way, you can make it so you can have breakable joints, where if you force things too much, they will just break. Um, and basically, it's like whatever else you can think of, uh, your imagination really is the limit. So here I'm just using some distance constraints between particles to make some ropes. And uh, this, the, the circles you see um, is just me with the mouse clicking. And I'm doing both pushing and pulling forces on these ropes. And you can imagine that this is uh, like the kinds of forces that would be applied when uh, like maybe a player was walking through some vines hanging down. And so that would push them out of the way or uh, maybe an explosion or an implosion, some kind of spell effects. <clears throat> and you can notice that uh, the more particles you have, the smoother the simulation is. But even the one on the left that only has three points, uh, you can imagine that if instead of drawing straight lines between those points like that, <clears throat> that you had some nice art, especially if you did uh, some spline through those points, that you could make it look more curved than it actually was. And so you don't always need a super high resolution physics simulation uh, to get to get good looking results in your game. Uh, so here I put the, the distance constraints in 2D. And so basically we have cloth as being two dimensional rope, which, which kind of makes sense, right? Because that's kind of what, what actual cloth is. Um, and once again, uh, that's me with the mouse just, just adding forces to it. Um, and something to note is that both with the, the cloth and with, with the, the ropes that we had in the last demo, it, it's, it's pretty plausible behavior, but we didn't actually have to program any of this. Uh, we're still using the simple update code that I showed before and uh, the constraint between particles. I will say, though, if you're going to be using this like in a 3D environment and you wanted to have this simulating like a character's cape and having it intersect their armor or something like that, that... When you do that, you, you would want to use a, a simplified mesh for the character. Because if you do, uh, 
if you test these points against uh, the full high resolution mesh, it's going to get really slow, really quick. And so a simplified mesh is how, how people get around that problem. Um, so here's some, some more solid objects. Uh, these are some boxes. I made them with distance constraints where I went around the outside of the particles and then also across the diagonals to keep them from, from squashing together. You could have also made boxes with, with angle constraints, but I just did them with distance constraints. And once again, you can see like the boxes, they, they bounce off the train, they roll, um, they slide. All this stuff was emergent behavior. We didn't have to program any of this explicitly. So again, just out of the constraints and the simple uh, Verlay update code we saw earlier that was four lines long, uh, that's, that's all it takes to, to get these nice behaviors, which is what makes Verlay so great for, for game development. So next up, I wanted to talk about how you would actually solve a distance constraint. So here we have a constraint where A and B must be four units apart, but they are only three units apart. Uh, the way that we solve this is we're going to move A and B both half unit apart away from each other. And the reason for this, as opposed to just moving point B one unit away or just point A one unit away, is that you don't want the physics system to have favorites because what that means is that if, if this line AB was crashing into something and B was hitting it and B was the thing that uh, would move one unit, you'd get a lot different behavior than if A was crashing into it uh, and B was the thing that resolved the collision. Uh, <clears throat> we basically, we don't want to play favorites in the physics system so that uh, you get more consistent behavior. And yeah, this, this, this function is real, real easy. Uh, all it does is it gets a normalized vector from A to B and then uh, figures out how much each point should move and then uses that normalized vector to, to move them outwards or inwards to be the correct length. Solving an angle constraint is very much the same. And uh, what we do in, in this one is that we just rotate A and C either inwards or outwards to make them be the, the proper angle but we want to make sure and preserve their length in this case. And so all we do is we, we average them to get uh, the middle vector between uh, BA and BC. And then we, we rotate them uh, vectors from that middle vector outwards to be the correct angle and make sure that those vectors have the right length. Uh, this, this function could be optimized. Uh, for instance, like we have this, these rotate 2D calls there. Uh, in practice, you would probably want to pre-calculate the rotation matrices, which in 2D just means you're going to pre-calculate cosine theta and sine theta. Uh, but this is not the only way that you could enforce angle constraints. Like you might notice that we're not actually moving point B when resolving this. So you might want to come up with some kind of method <clears throat> where all three points are moving equally to get to the constrained position. So a problem comes up, as you can imagine, where if you just have like a sea of points, like you have hundreds of points and some number of constraints between them, like another hundreds of, of constraints, that it might be difficult to solve all these constraints because they're all so interconnected. And if you're thinking that, you'd be exactly right. So even within a, a simple situation like this, where we have two constraints, where AB and BC must both be four units apart, but uh, BC is not. If we just if we go through and we fix AB, which is fine, and then we fix BC, which is not fine, we're going to end up some, with something like this, where BC is now fine, but AB is not. Um, on the surface, this this seems like a an unsolvable problem, right? In the general case, but luckily there's there's a, a real practical solution. And what what that is is that if you have your your n constraints, like your hundreds of constraints, you just iterate through them multiple times each frame. And when you do that, uh, you tend to reach a position where all the constraints are solved, uh, or at least approximately solved. And a nice thing is that even when they're not fully solved, is that the next frame, it'll pick up where it left off and continue to solve them. But even in cases where they can't be fully solved, like uh, the constraints, maybe they just legitimately have, uh, they fight each other and they can't all be, can uh, solved completely. 
it, uh, pardon me, it isn't, that isn't catastrophic. Uh, things tend to be pretty stable. Uh, you might get a little bit of jittering here and there, but, but uh, Verlet is pretty forgiving for this kind of thing. But of course, more constraint solving iterations means more computational cost. Uh, so I wanted to show some things. So uh, here's the rope physics simulation again, which only has uh, one one iteration through the uh, constraints each frame, and you saw that it was really stretchy. And now here it is with 64. And so in uh, in the first run through with only one iteration, uh, the ropes they looked elastic. Like we'll get to see it again. And that may not be a bad thing, depending on what it is that you're going for in your game. But if you do want to preserve the length of your rope and you want constraints better solved, is that you can uh, turn up the, the number of constraint solving iterations each frame to get that at that more cost. But if you don't care and you want the speed, you can definitely turn it down. Uh, in, in physics simulation and in games in general, uh, how you handle frame time is actually a, a really important yet subtle topic. So I wanted to talk about that too. <clears throat> um, kind of like a real straightforward way to handle frame time, whether it's in a physics simulation and an animation system or other gameplay systems, is just to take how long it took to render the last frame and use that as a multiplier into all your, uh, all your time-based effects for the current frame. And so if you do that, uh, the downside is that it's non-deterministic because every frame you're going to get slight fluctuations in how long frame time took. And uh, so these, these numbers going into your, your physics updates are going to change every time you, you, you run your physics simulation. And so if you run the same inputs in your physics simulation uh, and do it like twice, you're never going to get the same result twice. But an upside to doing this is that uh, your game time will equal your real time. So if your FPS goes up or down, it won't make the gameplay faster or slower. It'll, it'll stick to the wall clock time. Another way to handle frame time is just to give a constant frame time to your, your updates. And so what this would be like would be like, for your physics update, you just tell it every time, every frame to update, and you give it like 16 milliseconds as its update uh, frame delta. And so the, the, the pro to this, the upside, is that now your physics system is, is deterministic, where if you run the same physics setup, you know, as many times as you want, five times in a row, you're going to get the same result each time. But a downside to this is that if your FPS goes down, uh, the, the gameplay is going to slow down. And if your FPS is up, like you have VSync off and you're hitting 1,000 FPS, um, the game is going to get unplayably fast. And so that's not great. But there's actually a nice middle ground here, and that is you give a, uh, you give a constant frame time but you do a variable number of updates each frame. And so what I mean by that is you keep track of how much time has elapsed uh, between frames and you, you keep a sum of that, like a running total in a variable. And whenever that variable, uh, the time in that bucket is greater than your update time. So let's say we'll go with 16 milliseconds. So whenever uh, that variable is greater than 16 milliseconds, you run your, your physics update one time and you subtract out 16 milliseconds. And you repeat this until you have less than 16 milliseconds in that variable. The upside to this is that it's deterministic because you're always giving it that 16 milliseconds. So you can run the simulation over and over and over and keep getting the same results. Um, and another nice thing is that uh, your game time will always match real time. So FPS goes up or down, gameplay won't speed up or down. But there is a downside to this technique and that's that you can get into a death spiral. And what I mean by that is if your physics up up uh, update time was one millisecond, let's say, which is it's pretty low, um, but you had a lot of enemies on the screen, a lot of explosions, and it actually took two milliseconds to, to do your physics update, what would happen is you would do one physics update, and then the next frame it would say you needed to do two more. And so you'd do your two, and the next frame it would tell you you needed to do four. So you'd do your four, and the next frame you need to do eight. And you can see that it's just it's just growing, and uh, you're going to have problems pretty quick. A way you can handle this is just to to put a limit on the number of of updates that you're going to do a frame, and so this will keep it from spiraling out of out of control. 
uh, when you hit this problem, uh, the the gameplay will slow down, but something has to give. So this is this is a pretty nice um, pretty nice compromise. Uh, but again, uh, if you don't need determinism in your game, if that's not important, you may opt for the variable frame rate time, which is the first option. And then you get uh, game time equaling real time, which is nice. Uh, but but the problem you'll hit there is if you hit really high frame rates, you're going to have velocities that are really high. Uh, and so a thing you would want to do there is you would want to make sure that your, uh, your update uh, time was a minimum amount. Okay, cool. And there's a, a question in the chat. So what do I mean by variable update count? Okay, so what I mean by that is uh, we have three options here for handling time. The first one being variable frame time is we just do one up update every frame and we tell it how long the last frame took to render as its multiplier for physics, right? And so that's just one update per frame. Our second option is a constant frame time. So once again, we only do one update of the physics world every 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 frame, and we give it a constant time delta, like we say 16 milliseconds. So both of those guys, they only do one update every frame. The third option is where we do a variable update count. And what we do there, to recap, is we, we tell the physics world to update with 16 milliseconds whenever it does an update. But if the last frame took 32 milliseconds, we're going to do it twice so that we uh, can keep up with, with the clock in real time. Um, if our last time, if our last frame took 48 milliseconds, we're going to update it three times. And if we're running such that frames are taking eight milliseconds, we're only going to update every other frame. And yeah, so another question is, how do typical physics angel, engines handle this? Um, so from what I've seen is uh, they're, they're basically they're always configurable. And so if you don't want determinism, uh, the variable frame time thing is what uh, you can use. If you want determinism, uh, you probably also want um, your simulation to match the wall clock. And so people will generally go with the third one. Okay, and another question is, uh, when would non-deterministic physics be okay? Really, that's up to you guys uh, making the game. Um, and basically, it's just, is determinism something that you are interested in? Like, do you care if you give the same inputs that it gives the same outputs? Um, if you don't care about that, you don't need determinism. Cool. Oh, yeah, and I'll take this question, and then I'll move on. So... Is there any relation between the speed at which frames work and the display rate of the monitor? Yeah, there totally is. So if you have VSync on, it's going to limit it to 60 frames per second at max. And so if you're measuring the time that it takes to run a frame, uh, the lowest number, number you'll ever get is 16 milliseconds. It might go higher because you're, you're lower than 60 FPS, but it will, it will never go lower. Um, so I wanted to show real quick Here's what it looks like to have non-deterministic game physics. So this is the variable frame time. The box in the middle will sometimes come to rest leaning right and sometimes leaning left. So we'll go through that again and see real quick. So here it is leaning right, leaning left, leaning left, and leaning right. Um, and so you can see just because of the, the variation in frame rate, you get pretty different results. Uh, and then at, in contrast to that, uh, here's a variable update count, which is deterministic, but still keeps up with the wall clock time. So you'll notice the box in the middle, it always leans to the left. And you can see like uh, the behavior of the boxes is always the same every run. And so this is the difference between um, deterministic ph physics and non-deterministic. And yeah, another question, is this useful in mobile? Definitely so. Um, this is very computationally efficient. And so it's it's very prime for for a mobile app. Okay, so uh, I wanted to show you guys something kind of cool, kind of advanced, kind of not well known. And this is uh, you might have noticed in my demo, and I'll pop back real quick that at some point in time I replaced the flat ground with a sine wave. And so I uh, didn't really talk about that, but I will now. So when we're trying to do particle versus terrain collision, really what we've what we would hope for, like if we had our wish, is we want to know if a point in space is inside of the train. And if it is, we want to know the shortest path from that point to the surface. 
And we would like to know this in constant time, so like no loops, uh, regardless of whatever train complexity we have. So it sounds like a tall order, but we can actually do this. And we can do this using sign distance fields. And so we're going to get a, a peek of that real quick about what, what SDFs are all about. So sign distance fields, just like the name implies, uh, they give you a sign distance to the closest thing at any point, where that closest thing could be a surface, it could be a point in space. Uh, it's just a thing that the, the distance field is, is telling you about. And so it looks like this, where in 2D, distance is a, is a function of x and y, because you have a 2D point, and it's telling you a distance. And in 3D, you plug in your x, y, z, and it gives you a distance, where uh, it's just a, a floating point value. Um, going a little mathy for uh, some calculus stuff here. If you take the gradient at a point and normalize that gradient, that will give you the direction of the closest thing. And so that's going to be useful for us because we want to know how to get out of the surface or out of the train. And this normalizing the gradient will tell us which direction to go. Uh, and the distance will tell us how far to go along that, dis uh, that direction. So you can actually store sign distance fields in textures, or you can derive them from equations like at real time, uh, which is what, I, what I'm actually doing in all these demos. Um, Real quick, some other uses of sign distance fields are like the typical uses. On the left, I show uh, how they're used in 2D, which is for, for drawing things that look like they're, they're vector graphics uh, and they're, they're anti-alias. So like you can zoom in as much as you want on things rendered with SDFs and always see a smooth detail. It never uh, pixelates. And you can use it for anti-aliasing because if you know how far you are from a surface uh, in, in a pixel count, you can make the last couple of pixels to the surface be semi-transparent, and that gives you the aliasing you see on the left versus the uh, the non-aliasing you see on the right. Something else useful uh, you can use SDFs for is for ray marching. And so on the right, I show uh, ray marching of a, a bicubic Bezier uh, patch using a sign distance field. Um, so besides that, they're also useful for physics, like I was saying. Uh, if you define the ground as a function, which here is y equals sine of x, um, you can calculate the gradient of that and um, normalize that to get a direction. And you can uh, use the value of the function at that point and the gradient's length to get a distance. And so what this gives you is that at any point in space, you can ask if you're in the train, get a yes or no answer because your, your value will be positive or negative. And if you are in the train, it'll tell you what direction to go to get to the train the closest, the closest point of the train, and it'll tell you how far you have to go. Um, this stuff is just an estimate where the more complicated the function and the closer or the farther you are from the surface, uh, the less accurate the, the estimate will be. But with physics, uh, you're going to be normally having sh uh, shallow penetrations. And so for the most part, this is going to work really well. And um, Inigo Kila has actually wrote up a really nice post on this, and I have the link here on the slide. Uh, but but something else really cool about this is that uh, because this is all just, just math, you're just getting a gradient and a value of a function at a point in space, um, it really doesn't matter how complicated the train is. Uh, it's just constant time lookup. Um, and so here I made train by using Perlin noise and just thresholding it. I said, uh, pick the value. And said if if the uh, Perlin noise value is greater than this amount, um, it's going to be terrain. And so these these balls are just happily interacting with it using all the same math that that we've shown so far. Nothing nothing new, nothing special. And uh, here's here's the actual code for for terrain intersection. Um, line eighteen is the entry point. This intersection info. Uh, line nine is it uses central differences to get the gradient numerically. But uh, line three is the function you guys care about, which is here's the function that defines what our terrain actually is. And like here, I have y equals sine of x. But uh, this function, you can, you can plug in whatever you want. Um, you can do loops. You can do texture reads. You could shoot a ray against a mesh if you wanted to and do some logic based on that. Uh, basically, anything you want. Um, and, and this, this block of code will just, just handle it for you. Oh, it's a bit blurry. Okay, so the good news is uh, 
the slides are going to be made available. So check out the slides um, when, when they go up from on the, the YouTube video and such. Sorry about that. But yeah, the, uh, the thing to take away from here is you can just grab this code and replace uh, this function f with whatever terrain you want, and it'll just work for you. Something so far we haven't talked about is uh, object versus object collision. Like, particles can have constraints and they can stay out of terrain, but objects can interpenetrate like this, which is no good. So there's a pretty simple way to handle this. And what you do is when you move a particle, uh, you test it against a bounding box of all other objects. And for any bounding box that the particle is inside of, you want to test that particle to see if it's inside of a shape by testing against the line segments that make up that shape. When you're doing this, you want to test against all line segments in that shape because you want to get the, the closest line segment uh, for the particle to escape out of. Um, the reason for this is because if we just took the first line segment, uh, which may be like the farthest one, maybe the, the upper left in this pentagon, um, your particle will get pushed out the wrong direction. And so it'll be like it teleported through the object instead of being pushed back out of it. Uh, so this this algorithm, it'll work for you. Um, there may come a point at which it, you outgrow it, like if you're trying to do some really complicated stuff like box stacking or whatever. Uh, this will work for simple stuff. If, if you do outgrow it, um, there are other algorithms like the separating axis theorem, or a Minkowski portal refinement, or uh, something called GJK, which I have a link to here on this slide uh, that you can check out. That's pretty cool. In all the demos so far, the gravity has just been a constant downward vector, but there's no reason it has to be that way. Uh, this demo kind of shows what happens if you make gravity be a real gravity field. And what I'm doing is uh, making the function, or making the every point at space have a gravity vector be based on um, like the mass of the particles around it. Uh, it sounds pretty complicated, but it is actually not, it's not that bad. Uh, basically, if you want to know the gravity at a point in space, you just uh, find, you just like sum up the distance squared of, of all the points and that's, or one over the distance squared. And that's, that's basically uh, your gravity uh, magnitude and you, you average the, the vectors to get the direction that gravity is pulling you. So yeah, there's no reason why, why gravity has to be a constant for, for your entire scene. And this lets you do stuff like even program games like Mario Galaxy, where you can imagine you have like planetoids uh, floating around, where when you're, when you're running around on an object, it pulls you towards the center of it. But if you jump far enough away from it, uh, a different planetoid is going to grab you and pull you to it instead. So yeah, uh, Verlet physics is, is, is pretty versatile in that way. Um, a couple final topics. I see we're, we're getting low on time. Sorry about that. I'll try to leave some time for questions by going through this quickly. Um, uh, so I wanted to talk real quick about client-only and read-only physics. And so what this is useful for is uh, in single player, you can imagine you want to add like some, some things to your game that can break be kicked around, be pushed around by explosions. But uh, you can imagine too that if if you have a pile of boxes in a weird configuration that when a player steps on it, they won't, won't be able to walk off, right? Like they'll be stuck. So you can actually make a kind of like a read-only physics world where it's affected by the game game world, but it doesn't affect the game world. And so what that means is that a player can run through a stack of boxes and the boxes get kicked around and move and break and all those things. <clears throat> but the player never gets stuck on them. And so this is a way to kind of like add richness to the world without messing with the gameplay. Um, and also for multiplayer games, you can do the same thing where it's uh, a read-only physics world on the client, uh, where if you're playing a game like Call of Duty, let's say, and you want it to be where uh, explosions can break glass, push boxes around, maybe you want to have it to where you can kick soccer balls around and things like that. You can have that all happen on the client, and you don't network it across to other players. And so it looks like the world is much richer than it is. But in fact, different players will see different things on their screens. But they'll never notice unless they were like at a LAN party and they were sitting next to each other. Uh, so it's the illusion of, of richness without actually having to 
uh, serialize this across the network and increase the bandwidth usage. <clears throat> Something else important is if you have like a slow motion uh, thing in your game, like maybe a, a player can activate uh, slow motion and then they have more time to fight or aim or whatever, uh, your physics update will run slower, but it will be very blocky. Like your physics objects will be in one point and then they'll teleport at the next point. Uh, a way to deal with this is you can actually interpolate between your, your physics states. And so if your, your time, if your physics update time was 16 milliseconds, but your time bucket only had 8 milliseconds in it, what you would want to do is render things uh, at the position that was 50% uh, interpolated between the last two positions of that object. And so that will make it move smoothly uh, when, when time slows down. And this will actually help it at normal frame rates as well. Um, for GPU friendliness, uh, this is very like a low powered thing, which is really nice uh, and low storage. You only need to store the current and last position of each particle and the constraints. Uh, so yeah, real efficient, so great for mobile. And this part makes it good for GPU. But the problem is that uh, constraints themselves can't be parallelized very well because you might have multiple constraints acting on the same particles. And so you have uh, conflict. Um, so that's that's kind of a problem. Um, I wanted to show you, here's an actual playable game on Shader Toy, and there's the link to it. Uh, but again, yeah, like when the video comes out, I'll, I'll put these links to be uh, clickable in the description or something. But all that happens is when you're pressing accelerate in this game, is it, it adds acceleration to the front and the back wheel. And really, uh, that's the only functionality that this is using. Um, it has the normal Verlay physics update and all that stuff like we talked about. It'd be cool to add like some ropes and bridges and stuff to that. But um, yeah, as you can see, it's real playable with just uh, a couple features. So I'm hoping that after you guys have seen this talk, um, if you didn't know how to do these sort of physics before, that you'll feel confident like uh, going out and be able to program that yourself. Here's some more resources. I'll get these, these links uh, yeah, on the video. And here's the summary. And so that's it for me. We're almost out of time, but we have time for a couple questions. Oh, yeah. OK, so one question. Can you share some ways to use the particles, particle data to transform sprites? Um, if we want to apply texture to the box in your previous example. Um, yeah, definitely. OK, so what you do is you want to, if you make a box out of constraints, like I did with, with uh, those box simulations, you want to give a texture UV to each particle. And so that way, uh, your texture is already mapped to the square. And then as your square distorts, you, you, uh, you still use those UVs. Um, and when you render this box, you want to break it into two triangles. And so your UVs will stretch and squish a little bit as much as your box will stretch and squish. Um, thank you, Gustavo, for saying a killer talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Glad to hear that. Um, so uh, Mariah was asking, where can you get these resources that I showed right now? Um, all the links, I'll make sure that when, when the video goes public, after uh, Rupesh gets them up, um, I'll make sure that these are in the description and clickable, which I think he said it was going to be like one to two weeks uh, before the videos went live. Um, you can also hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter handle's here on the lower left. And uh, I can give you these resources. And uh, hey, Navanil, how's it going, man? And uh, also, if you have any questions or like hit any problems like implementing this, let me know and I will totally help you out. Oh yeah, Prince of Persia. Okay, so uh, in Prince of Persia, the world slowed down, but the player was moving at normal speeds. Uh, can you explain how it works uh, that they work at different speeds? Oh yeah, okay, so that's, that's super simple. You literally just... Uh, uh, actually, I guess it's not so simple, but uh, <laughs> uh, the short answer is um, when when you slow down time, like if time is moving half as fast, uh, you make the player the player's velocity move twice the speed. And so basically in that Verlay update function uh, where, where we calculate the velocity um, using the old timestamp, you can use uh, half the timestamp. And so that'll make it move twice as fast. Uh, Sorry, that's, that's a quick answer. Hit me up on Twitter, and uh, I'll totally help you guys out or answer any questions or give you any of these resources. But cool, we are out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming so much. And yeah, again, hit me up on Twitter, and we can chat more. Thanks, everyone.
Oh.